G'day legends, I hope that you're having a fantastic day and a fantastic start to the week no matter where you are. Now we do have a fair bit to go over today of course, we're going to have a look at the maps and some geolocated footage that I found very interesting to show where some of the reconnaissance assets are as well as asset storage as well as what we're seeing difference in geolocations to map movement. So that will be in the second half of the video. We're going to talk about a drone strike on the Zap power plant as well of course that is a nuclear power plant and the largest one in ukraine we're going to look at a new drone we're going to look at missile strikes and we're going to look at a little bit of everything but where we are going to start and i guess the bulk of this video is going to be about russia's 2024 offensive campaign that we expect to see in the next month maybe two months really kick off now that may be when it first really comes through massively, but we have seen Russia on the offensive for now the last three months with then Avdivka, the fall of Avdivka, and that move up to lines. And we have seen that red on the maps inching forward to quote Zelensky that it will continue to inch forward. And of course, this is taking advantage of problems that Ukraine is having, ammo, manpower, air defense, and that Russia has fixed a lot of its problems it did have ammunition, manpower, and aerial use of weapon systems. And Budinov, of course, the head of intelligence, has spoken about this as well of when we expect to see this in an interview today. We expect Russian offensive actions to intensify in late spring and early summer, especially in the Donbass area. They will push a little closer to Shasov Yar. We'll look at the maps because Russia has entered Shasov Yar, of course, just west of the infamous Bakhmut. They'll move towards the city of Pokrovsk in the strategic direction of Pokrovsk. And then as well, it does not expect any major changes on the front until this Russian offensive begins. So we're not going to see, he's saying that we're going to see anything major. I think we are seeing some major things, but each their own. The situation is quite difficult, but it is under control contrary to the assessment of various military experts. So we keep hearing this, that it's under control. It's not moving too much. But depending on the strategic value of some areas, we're not really sure. Budinov also believes a Ukrainian offensive is possible this year. What is very interesting, because myself and a lot of other people have put that most likely we will not see a Ukrainian offensive this year. And the reasoning for this is what has actually changed since last year's failed offensive. If anything, things have got worse. Now, this is as unbiased as I can be, but what we can say is Ukraine last year had new weapon systems come in. Some of those weapon systems have been destroyed, but Ukraine has become more proficient on those systems, such as the Bradley tanks, but uh, Bradley tanks, the Bradley IFVs and Leopard tanks, maybe the Abrams as well. We haven't really seen the Challies in any mass use at all yet, but where there has been slight improvement on that, what we have seen is a huge shell shortage that even if the US signs off money will take a long time to fix, we have manpower shortages, which if it can be fixed, will take a long time to fix. And of course, the main issue currently right now that Ukraine is facing is the limited air defense. And as well, that Russia is taking more ground, therefore you're going to have to fight through that. So what is difference between last year and this year for success of an offensive? Well, Russia's had another year to build up defensive works. Nothing too major has come in that would change the swing for the success of that offensive. So me and a lot of others sit in this most likely won't see a Ukrainian offensive this year, or at least one that will be more successful than what we saw last year. And now as well in this, we need to talk about Zelensky noting yesterday that only 10% of the fighter aircraft uh, that were promised are arriving in 2024. Now this is from the ISW, but you can it's all from uh, him on TV, but caution the arrival of the promised F-16 jets in Ukraine from partners in 2024 will uh, provide Ukraine with only 10% of the fighter aircraft Ukraine would need to completely defeat Russian aviation and restore Ukraine's ability. Now, what we've spoken about is, is this 10% of that then promised or 10% of what Ukraine assessed that they would need because that is going to be very different. What was promised even at the highest end of that promise is still well, well below maybe 30% of what is assessed to be needed to re-swing that air effectiveness and superiority in the air if possible as well as there's going to have to be 
uh, some policy changes with strikes into Russia to actually have any uh, overarching air dominance as well. And against those systems, S300, S400, S500 is going to still be incredibly challenging, if even possible. But again, this definitely is a kick in the nuts for those who have banked this asset as being the next Wunderwaffen, as of course this wonder weapon that the Leopards, the Bradleys, the Challengers, the uh, Abrams, and a lot of other systems uh, pay, uh, no, sorry, Patriot, then your uh, Scalp, your Storm Shadow, your systems like this that have a huge effect in the beginning, and this is what that Ukraine officer the other day was saying, huge effect in the beginning, and then it really tails off as Russia learns to deal with these systems better and change their own policies and learn and shift how that then works. But these fighter jets, this was really the promise this year that people were going forward. Once these are here, everything changes, and we'll see a massive offensive action, but only 10% are arriving. How much change will that actually have? Probably minimal at that. And Zelensky has say, spoken just today, about in a video meeting saying it is necessary to spe uh, specifically tell Congress that if Congress does not help Ukraine, Ukraine will lose the war. And that is speaking more so about that money that's kept in America. Now, we know that in the short term, Europe cannot plug the hole the US would create if they left. Yes, some people are saying, well, Europe is increasing its military might, blah, blah, blah. But you're talking a decade. Yes, in a decade, potentially. There's not a decade left in this war. I believe there's still many years, many months. Maybe there's a day. Maybe there'll just be something signed any day. But from my assessment, there's still many years left in this war. Yes, Europe will increase you know, substantially their offering to NATO and their strength. But for Europe to fill the hole that the US would leave would take a decade. And like Zelensky said, if the US leaves, there's going to be a huge problem there. Now, what a lot of the sort of stars are aligning to is looking at a Trump presidency and what he has said then about ending the war via negotiations. And this is why right now I think is the best time for Russia to launch then their offensive campaign and what we're being told when the campaign will be. What we know is Ukraine is short on everything at the front, from men to weapons to morale to support, all of this. And I think that Russia potentially sees a November finish line, and this push in May, early June, is when Ukrainian intel suggests that that will come, but also when the weapon systems will be at their lowest, things like air defence, and to capture what they can before there may be a forced negotiation by the US if Trump was to get into power. And I'm going to talk a little bit at length about all of this. But Zelensky in his nightly address said this, the situation in Kharkiv is very harsh. We know there's a lot of glide bombs have been landing in there as well as drones, missiles and successful strikes. Russians begin uh, using guided aerial bombs, so glide bombs making it into Kharkiv. Ukraine clearly lacks sufficient air defence systems, and this is evident to all of our partners. He speaks as well about patriots. Ukrainian officials, every word the last couple of weeks has been that they need patriot systems, that these are what engages. Of course, spoken about six to eight batteries, which would be double what Germany actually has. It would be a lot of what the US has. And these systems, these aren't just something you can pack up that are in a shed to ship out. A lot of these are being used. They're incredibly expensive, very complex as well. So we don't know how much is there. What a lot of people are saying is Ukraine's probably starting a negotiation high and will settle somewhere lower on what actually comes. But Patriots must now be in Ukraine. So there will be no need to use them on NATO's eastern flank in the future. And this is something that is being told more and more in the narrative, whether it's by Zelensky or Biden or um, Stoltenberg or any of those, is that to arm Ukraine now is to not have to arm NATO later on down the path. And this has been a narrative change that I think has been a very difficult shift for a lot of people, is for the first two years of the war, being told Russia has no missiles, they've got no good air defence, their air force is weak, they've got no tanks, they've got no men, they're fighting with shovels, to now we've seen this swing of, if we don't arm Ukraine now with high-tech weapon systems, that Russia is a threat to NATO, they are a threat to democracy around the world, and that the effect of these weapon systems is greater. And this has been this huge shift that I think has had a huge backfire. But 
as well. This is the time frame I think that we potentially are working on, that I think Russia is seeing that we're working on. I'm not saying that it's going to end in November, but I'm saying I think that it, this is why people are aligning things to when Ukraine will have the least amount of weapons, Russia is rebuilding, when we're getting told Russia will push, and a potential administration shift. Now, what we do need to talk about in this is President Donald Trump. So this video is probably already going to be restricted by saying that word. This isn't political. I'm just speaking about what I see as an Aussie looking in at what will happen here. But Trump has privately said this from Washington uh, Post, I believe. He could end a Russia's war in Ukraine by pre pressuring Ukraine to give up some territory. Now, this was released today. Trump's proposal consists of pushing uh, Ukraine to cede Crimea and the Donbass border region to Russia. According to people who discussed it with Trump uh, or his advisors and spoke to the condition of anonymity because these conversations were confidential. So there's a snake in the grass in any of those. But what we're talking about is down in the Donbass region and Crimea, which we know anyone who isn't afraid to say, we know that Crimea, that Donbass region, even for the most out there proposals, is a bloody stretch. Even if that money were to go through for offences, for whatever, it's still a bloody stretch to see that Ukraine will regain that territory. Although not maybe impossible, but it is still a stretch. And many, many military experts, high-ranking officers have spoken about the at what the realistic potential of that is militarily at least ra rather than some diplomatic change or a swap or whatever. But that approach, which has not been previously reported, would uh, dramatically reverse President Biden's policy, which has emphasised curtailing Russian aggression and providing military assistance to Ukraine. As he seeks to return to power, of course, Trump, the uh, presumptive Republican nominee, has re uh, frequently boasted that he could negotiate a peace deal between Russia and Ukraine in less than 24 hours if elected. And we have seen that spoken about before by Trump with a relationship with then President Putin. Uh, peeling away uh, Russia, uh, sorry, peeling Russia away from China would presumably involve sanctions relief. So this is speaking about this bringing together of China and Russia. Now, this is from Jeremy Shapiro, the head of the Washington Office of European Council on Foreign Relations. Trump people feel as if one of the great sins of the Ukraine war and the Russian policy, generally speaking, is to push Russia towards China and to make it all more dependent on China. Uh, Trump's fundamental approach with all things is to get the men in a room together to discuss. But this push into China, but we've also see this, the less reliance on external forces, reliance then on uh, domestically produced product and in, of course, funding things like into BRICS as well. So there has been this less reliance on the West and heavily reliance on other countries. And we're seeing this and this push toward China. And as well, we got intel only yesterday. I should have spoken about this yesterday, but it doesn't matter that the US has warned allies of China's growing technological assistance to Russia's war. As the two countries' military collaboration strengthens, we know that China has said they've got a no-limits relationship with Russia. And this was, of course, about geospatial satellite imagery for military use. I think we all knew this was likely happening. It's just like the US, the UK, and on satellites up there, is supplying all of this into Ukraine, as well as from AWACS-style aircraft, spy aircraft, you want to call them over the Black Sea in Romania, in uh, Poland, sending information to Ukraine, that China is likely doing similar, or the US is saying that like, are they likely doing similar geospatial intelligence, integrates data from network of technologies ranging from satellites to mobile sensors, ground control stations, and aerial imagery. Satellite imagery has played a crucial role for both sides of the war in Ukraine. Of course it does with where things are, how things are going, but we have spoken that there has been an increase in uh, high targeting by Russia in the last couple of months, and this may have had some push on that as well and increase that as well as, you know, I think one of the biggest things people spoke about was that Russia can't adapt and evolve militarily, which we have seen and again has been in that propaganda then space. Now more on this article. Trump's team is thinking about this uh, very much in silos, that this is just a Ukraine-Russia thing. They think of this as a territorial dispute rather than one about the whole future of European security and by world order and the world order by extension. So saying that they see this as a border dispute, not then as world order and European security. And I can see why people see this because what we were told in the first years was that, China, that Russia sorry, poses no threat that Ukraine is defeating them, Russia's got nothing left, whatever. And now we're being told 
They're making all this. They make 3 million shells a year, North Korea supplying, China supplying. Now, if we don't fund Ukraine with all these patriots, we're going to need patriots on our border and we're going to be fighting Russians. We've seen Biden say that, that there will be US troops fighting Russians if we don't fund. So there's been this huge shift and I can see why People have the other opinion here of saying, no, this is a Ukraine-Russia thing because look at where this actually is. It's below 20% of land. Can Russia realistically push through here? Probably not. Can Ukraine realistically push through here? Probably in a real world, probably not. That it's still a localised war, but could very quickly become much larger with the involvement of China or direct involvement, I mean direct shooting involvement from Western countries, China, whatever in as well. There is a tiptoe on this line. Now, number four here, that in this, and I vehemently disagree with this, but no amount of leverage the US uh, has is likely to compel Ukrainian leadership to engage in policies that would constitute domestic political suicide. So, of course, if Zelensky said we are having some sort of concession, we're changing this, changing that, it would be political suicide. Yeah, we know that. But the US has a hell of a lot of leverage over Ukraine. Not only are they paying the pensions of bloody everyone and they're the largest donor, but they also have the, then that money stuck. The US has huge leverage over Ukraine. Don't deny that they don't. But this is from Michael Kaufman, an analyst at Russia, Ukraine war at this endowment of international peace, but also saying, and no amount of leverage that the US uh, has can compel Ukraine to cede territory or engage in these types of concessions. This is a situation where if you're willing to give a hand, the other side will very quickly want the rest of the arm. I don't disagree if you give a hand that they want the rest of the arm, but at the end of the day, if the US right now was to say we're not funding into Ukraine anymore, Ukraine have a few options. Zelensky has said that they would lose the war. So the options are you either have to then seek a, a diplomatic negotiation there, and that would, that would just have a concession of land that's what it would have to be, or there's going to be a militarily suicide mission made. That, If the US pull out, uh, just to be brutally honest, that is what you would be looking at. The US does have massive, massive leverage over Ukraine and paying pensions. All of this, of course, has political will and pull on this. It does. And not only that, US companies have a hell of a lot in Ukraine as well. Things like Vanguard, things like BlackRock, all of this. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot here. We should never downplay how much pull they may actually have. Now, US elections, who's going to win? I don't know. But I go on betting websites to look at this because I just don't believe anyone's polls because if CNN or Fox or whatever get the poll wrong, what does that matter? No one cares. People already clicked on it and paid the ad money. But Betting websites, they lose money if they're wrong. But in this, it will put Donald Trump just ahead of Biden. This is a sports bet, I believe. Not really sure. And then RFK then in third. So still very close, but pushing then Trump ahead. And from the outside looking in, from what I see, that's, I think, probably where it's going to end up. But I have no idea. I'm not an American voter. And although it will affect, I guess, the rest of the world, seeing either way that goes. But I think a few things with Biden, with Israel, uh, with the um, trans day thing on Easter, I think was just suicide with some of that as well. I don't know. I won't speak too much on the politics of it. Now we need to talk about down in Zap Oblast. Of course, they're the huge power plant, the nuclear power plant down across from Nikopol. Of course, this is the cooling pond and across here. Now, what we have seen before, we have seen Ukrainian military operations. I know guys who are on these operations that crossed into here and launch offensive toward an Azar power plant as well. If you ever see my reports, I was about here when I was doing some of those reports because every couple of months it kicks up that this is about to melt down and we've seen even videos released for protecting yourself from radiation, all of this. So let's then speak on that at length. So let me open up this properly. So what we have is from the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency. We know that they are present there, but experts have been enforced by ZNPP that a drone detonated on the site today. Such detonation is consistent with IAEA observations, saying, I urge to refrain from actions that contradict the five IAEA principles and jeopardize nuclear safety from the Director General. And we have seen Russia keep military equipment in this, and we have seen Ukrainian strikes directly then against this power plant. 
Of course, everyone has said that it is not us when it comes to this. So this is from TASS Russian News. Russian Foreign Ministry uh, spokeswoman Maria Zakharovka, um, who called on the agency, said, clearly state the danger to the nuclear power plant comes from Ukraine. Of course, this is occupied by uh, Russia, the power plant, and saying that the danger here is by Ukraine. One thing I will say is both Ukraine and Russia, going back through Soviet times, have a hell of a lot of experience with nuclear reactors and nuclear energy. Yes, you'll point at the one example of when it all went wrong, of course, up near Kiev, but as far as uh, nuclear science and development of energy or this, both countries really know what they're doing with nuclear reactors. That, of course, doesn't mean you bloody strike them, but it's not like there's a lack of knowledge. It's not like you've got me on the bloody buttons up there. And then, of course, Ukraine has denied this. Andrew Yusov, of course, a spokesman for Ukraine, has said Ukraine is not involved in any armed provocations on the territory illegally occupied by Russia at the Zap ZNPP, Zaporanger nuclear power plant. So we know something has hit there. What I did find interesting was that the Western mainstream media, this is Seven, uh, sorry, seven, nine news Australia. There's also seven news Australia and AP that they are saying that it is a Ukrainian drone hit the atomic reactor, condemn the Ukrainian drone strike, uh, one of six nuclear reactors. So they are saying that it is Ukraine, and typically they wouldn't be putting that out there. So that's just there. No strike should ever be on these. Of course, there should be no military equipment onto these either. That it would be a massive disaster if something happened here, but. One thing I do want to speak about is false flag attacks. And we have said there is risk of when one side gets desperate, the risk of the increased risk of a false flag, horrific attack definitely then increases. Of course, we saw Ukraine then launch the their counteroffensive, and then we saw the Novokokovka Dam then spill out over here. Of course, it's still up in the air who took that, but we saw when the offensive happened, started then this then flooded when we saw then russia on the offensive a couple of years ago we then saw Nord Stream blow up all of which could potentially be then false flag events you know creating disasters whatever that we have spoken about the danger of when russia or when ukraine becomes desperate when there is uh, we speak about this war that it will inch 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 but eventually like bankruptcy and people quote me on this don't quote me on this but like bankruptcy little by little by little and then we'll sort of all fall apart look at like avdivka avdivka did that in a small way and other areas saw russia's offensive right in the beginning of the war do that as well but on when it's larger scale that when it starts falling apart is there risk of russian fuck it we're firing a nuke in or threaten of false flag attacks somewhere to create a disaster also for PR wins as well as finger pointing all of this. And people will, of course, look at the circus massacre as part of that as well. So there is real danger to areas like this down the path. And I'd hate to see this happen because it would just be bloody horrible. Now, we're going to speak about drones and aircraft. Now, nothing more has come out about the aircraft supposedly destroyed in Crimea and in Russia. There's said to be many Su-34s, Su-27s, bloody bombers, all this. There's no more satellite imagery. There's no videos. Nothing has come out. But Kiev Independent does have it as their leading story today. Russia reportedly loses seven aircraft. So I don't know. There's no evidence to support that as well as a lot of the other claims are in aircraft. We need to look at then drones overnight. So the enemy, this is from the Defence Forces of Southern Ukraine, that there was an Iskander then hit Odessa, causing a fire, but then all 11 uh, attack drones that were fired in the Dnipro direction were shot down as well. And of course, we've then seen uh, more strikes in Kharkiv from drones and guided uh, glide bombs as well. Now, this footage has come out over Belgorod, of course, in Russia, just above Kharkiv, of this very fast jet-powered drone here. So moving across the sky. And what people are pointing out that this is, is Russians published footage of a fallen kamikaze drone as claimed in this Donetsk region, not 100Ks from the front line. The kamikaze drone is a modified British dual jet training target for Banshee jet. So this is what the Russians have posted has come down. These are the images. And then this is a Royal Navy, so UK Banshee jet here so what these are these go in the air and then fighter jets or air defense sort of can then strike these as a target being used but interestingly that this is 
apparently seen, look, you can't, can't jail at this, but apparently seen over Russian territory of that modified system that said definitely not 100% set in stone. Now, let's have a look at the maps and some geolocations. Of course, we have Ukraine, the centre, the capital of Kiev, the red areas occupied since 22, and the purple since 2014. Now, I do just want to look at some footage first, straight off the bat. So let's look at then this HIMARS strike. So this HIMARS strike here, we see a Russian military vehicle here at a service station as well. People saying this is an EW vehicle. I'm not familiar enough with the vehicles, but this is said to be, I've got a heap of geolocations here, but it is down in this region here. So you can see her son and that it is, say, 30 kilometers ish then behind the front line of course being struck with a high mars system so we see this here and then we have really high quality footage of this too from two different angles that will of course be then guiding this bomb in and a strike on the service station here and the destruction of vehicles and of course there would be most likely casualties along with this so we don't actually know the full aftermath of the destruction here. Now, funnily enough, all the top comments on these videos on the pages I was looking at, they are all saying Ukraine needs to double tap these to inflict higher casualties. Well, one, an eye for an eye. But secondly, this is in Ukrainian territory. You do realise the people working at the service station and the emergency first responders are going to be Ukrainian? Like, it's down in here. Yeah, and double tapping is a horrible thing, and whether it's Israel or Russia or Ukraine doing it, I don't give a shit. I'll call it out when I then see it, and it is a horrible thing. But a successful HIMARS strike there as well. We know HIMARS strikes have to go, well, we're told that they have to then go back up through chain of Western command as well for targeting. We're not 100% sure. Maybe in the beginning it was that. But this can be seen as, uh, as a dual-use target military filling up at a servo can strike this but there will be civilian casualties likely in your assessment of a target like this and we see this similar from russia into ukraine as well now we do need to look at then uh, another video that is then geolocated to here so of course we see then this building down here now let's have a look at where this is so we'll see then this is pokrovsk and zoom out a little bit more so we can get of where we exactly are and then we'll see where Donetsk city is Avdivka so it's just a little bit lost then for a second and we can sort of get a bit of a look at where the front line is and how far behind the line this is so just outside of Avdivka we're talking say 55 60 kilometers behind the line we then see a targeted strike from a Russian missile system here of course drone footage as well we see this vehicle going into this building showed you the geolock on this and then a successful strike on that building and then a subsequent burn up that people are saying that this is showing that it was some level of warehouse with ammunition whatever i'm not enough an explosive expert to say that was or wasn't and i'm guessing that you aren't either now i just want to refresh this map just in case it has updated but no the uh deep state map MOD map, whatever you want to call it, I know what I call it, hasn't updated, but we will use it just to show you about where we are looking. So let's go up into Bakhmut straight off the bat. So we're talking in here. Of course, what Russia is trying to do is get Shasavya. We know that they've entered the first buildings around Shasavya here, and we do have a few different updates. Of course, this map hasn't updated. So then we will use, we haven't used it for a while, but the Rybar Russian sources map. So you see Ivanovsky, we see a de definite different push around. See this road where it curves here. This is this road to the same that Russians are way up somewhere into here, as well as it's somewhat matching down this road, saying that where the Russian forces have then entered these first fortifications of Shasavya as well. So the, the maps line up in some spots, don't in others. And of course, the grey zone expansion here doesn't anywhere even close to what this map is then showing. We'll leave this one up and then we'll bring up the Suryak map. We have a couple Suryaks for this location. So we've got one into the north of this as well. So let's minimize this one. So we see this is the road through Kromove and this is the Ivanovsky road saying that there is an increase of control around the train line here near Botanivka and Russian pages are um, 
are saying that Bordonivka has come under Russian control completely today. Let's look at what this say. Situation east of Chesov. Yeah, Russian army took control over 85% of Bordonivka. That's what Surek's saying. After Ukrainian army were forced to retreat from most of the locality following Russian attacks from north and southeast. Uh, forest only some houses in the south and warehouses fortified area remains under Ukrainian control. And this will then be a withdrawal into Kalinivka and then into Shasov Yar. One thing we are seeing in somewhere like Shasov Yar is an increase in fighter aircraft being used, primarily Su-25 aircraft firing unguided missiles. But what we are seeing is they have a lot of freedom of movement in and around and over this area, indicating that there is little to no air defense actually covering these areas, which is a big problem, and will then lead into Russian advances here too. So that is something that we will see more of as the air defense has to be allocated to a strategic targeting areas. Like the Patriots have to be at Kiev, they have to be at Odessa. They're just not enough to cover all these areas and air defense. If it's running low, we will see an increase of Russian successful use of those planes. Now, we looked at that map that was in the north part of Bakhmut. Now we have a map that's in the south part. So, of course, this is Ivanovsky here and just some crossings here. So this is lining up more so where the Suryak said, but it's really uh, – sorry, more so where the Rybar said, but it's right in between what Deep State and Rybar is saying. The Rybar said like right up in here where this is showing just Ivanovsky, but showing there is some control just in these regions. We can see where the peak of the road is in these regions here as well as further down this road into Shasov Yar, as well, that road through Kromove. But Russian army took control over new trenches at Mount Baba and advancing northwest of Ivanovsky until the ponds. We know that the high ground here is cre incredibly important for the defence and the offence for this whole region. Now, we're just going to move a little bit down into Avdivka. Of course, no map movement on here, but what we will look at is then Pervomayevsky. Now, of course, this is where we've seen Russia have advances through Vodiani. So, of course, this down here is still this town of Korpermaisky is here. But we do have some geolocated footage. So, I can't show you the footage. It'll be on the Telegram if you'd like to see it. But we do see this is from a Ukrainian drone then targeting Russian troops here. Now, I can't show you the footage, but this is geolocated to here. So, have a look at the way this square paddock is and where this track then turns out of course, Vodiani, Pervomayevsky, that this lines up to be square paddock, track coming out, it's on this corner, on this corner, so right here. So we know that there's 100% Russian troop presence here somewhere. So the grey zone should at least be here, if not if it's troop presence, that the red somewhere like this. We're not 100% sure yet, but we do know there's 100% uh, troop presence there because of the targeting then against them. Now, Let's have a look on a few of these other maps. Of course, this is... Oh, do I have a number one of this? No, we have two. So we have an OL reports map here too. So a Russian army continue advancing west and north of the army. So down here. Only 750 metres remain for the first houses of Netolovy. And situation of Ukrainian army in the western part of Burmaisky is very complicated. So, of course, it's showing right here. That's that corner where we saw the drone dropping. So this one's probably more accurate and an increase out to the north, closing up on these paddocks in the grey zone shown here, but also moving down along where this creek and reservoirs then run. Now, lining up with this map, let me move this across, is then we have uh, then this map here, which is the uh, Noel Reports map. Now, this isn't the easiest to see, but we can see Bovomayevsky, in here, we can see see this reservoir, these reservoirs, these are lining up in here. And we can see that this is showing an increase in the north over these fields here. So we do know this north and push definitely happened between Tomenki and here. So these are the same areas being shown. So let me get rid of those. Now, we just need to move slightly to the north here, so this is Avdivka, the north, we'll talk about Krasnogorivka here as well, and of course the train line pushing out here, just to give you an idea of where we're talking. We have a Noel report update in this region, so we come down. Now, this is not the easiest thing to line up anyway, but we see Krasnogorivka, see the train line bend here, we see this reservoir, that there is Russian control pushing right up until here, then down this tree line, so... I won't even draw it, but up this tree line, 
across and then down in here, said to be under rush control, as well as down just underneath, out from Stapovi and Badachi area, somewhere just in here more. So we can see these trees just in here. That there was a Russian advancement here too, but very difficult to line up. We see these two small, larger tree line. So just in this region by the Noel Reports map, but we do know that northern push definitely happened because I believe yesterday on this map it showed a grey zone increase here. I could be wrong. Yep, we see a grey zone push somewhere in the north. So yeah, We'll, we'll take it as if there is definitely a push in the north, as well as then Suriac maps here. So, again, not easy to line up, but it is talking this area. This is Krasnoyevka. This is right where we're speaking. So, these two maps do line up. You can see where this road bends. This is the same road that Russian Army restart operations in this axis and managed to capture a warehouse southeast of Novoklody and the adjacent farm. So, showing same areas between. Different sources, people that wouldn't like each other may not sit down and have a bevy together in those areas. 36 minutes-ish. Legends, thank you for your support. As always, I do love being here and speaking to you. Look after yourselves. Have a fantastic day, and I'll see you in tomorrow's video. Thank you. Bye-bye.